You made it to church, and I'm so glad. And again, my name is Pastor Peter Haas, and I, I, I of course, want to warn you again that today's message is PG, and we're going to be hitting subjects related to the birds and the bees. And so if you're driving in your car listening to this message as a podcast with your third grader, you may have a few interesting conversations over the next couple minutes later on, but because we're going to get a little crazy in this message today. But right out of the gate, here's, here's what we're going to talk about. And I, I, I love this aspect of Christianity because Jesus was such a unique character, wasn't he? And, and one of the things that made Christ so unique was that sinners ran to him, and yet he never compromised the standard of Scripture. In other words, um, Jesus was always quite clear about what he believed on sexuality, what he believed about getting drunk, what he believed about money, and yet sinners simultaneously felt accepted around him. In fact, I, I, and I want to explore that today. Obviously, Jesus took a lot of criticism uh, for being so accepting, and yet the paradox is that he, all, he never compromised the standards of Scripture. He was always very clear about it. And I, I want to ask the question today, why? Why were people so comfortable around him even though he held high moral standards? I want to explore that because I think that Christ had a unique way of approaching people. And if you and I could just tap into that, if you and I could understand what it was that made Christ unique, I believe that not only will it change us, but it's going to change a lot of our relationships, the way that we interact with our coworkers and other people. But uh, to set all this up, what I want to do is, before we dive into the Bible, I want to share with you a story that I believe is going to give some of you some soul tension. And by soul tension, I mean it's going to just disturb you a little bit, okay? And I, I'm warning you this way because I, I want you to stick with me because I'm going to balance this out, okay? Because part of my job as, I actually see my job as less of a Bible teacher and more of a create soul tension that drives you to Scripture. Do you see the difference, okay? I could stand up here and I could just pre-digest truth and just kind of spit it out to you guys like a mama bird to a baby bird pre-digested food. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of gross. And uh, I, think, I think there's a better way to do that. I think if I can create soul tension that will drive you deeper into Scripture, you're going to be better for it, okay? So just um, take a deep breath with me and, um, and, and just absorb this because this was, I'm going to tell you a story that, that started changing the way I thought about a lot of topics. There was a delightful guy in our church who came to me with, um, with, with kind of a, a secret in his life. Actually, by this point, it wasn't a secret. It had actually come out um, into the light. He was addicted to pornography. Um, he was addicted to alcohol. And as often happens with these types of addictions, they finally escalated into a full-on affair. And not just one affair, but there was a prolonged affair that eventually was found out. And of course, after the affair, his, his marriage started crumbling. His wife could not handle being around him anymore because the pain was too great. And she just didn't believe that he was truly um, willing to change. And there was some truth to that, but, but really what, what messed with this guy who was coming to me for help was that he had three teenage daughters that had a newfound hatred for him and just really sided with their mom on all of this. And he, he realized, wow, I'm going to lose my entire family. I literally will not have a family when all this is done. And he started thinking about his future and it snapped him into a sobering reality. And actually, he came to me because he really wanted to change. He really wanted help. And he wanted to win back the trust and the respect of his wife. He wanted to win back the, the respect of his three daughters. But he was plagued with a question that he needed to settle first. And it's this, okay? Just stick with me. He said, are these sexual desires that I'm experiencing, are these temptations, are they who I am? In other words, is this deeper for me than it is for other people? Am I able to overcome these things? Am I destined to be a serial, serial adulterer who will always be addicted to porn, always needing to partner swap? Because if so, why should I even say that I'm going to be try, to try to be faithful to my wife if deep down I'm not going to be because it's not who I am? And, and many of you guys remember um, a couple weeks ago when we started this series called Address the Mess, 
I shared the research on porn that people who use porn have dramatically increased odds of divorce, dramatically increased correlation with depression, dramatically increased correlation with abuse, dramatically increased correlation with anxiety, dramatically increased uh, correlation with sexual dissatisfaction, and a dramatically increased odds of future affairs. And so this young dad was sitting in my office and he knew he was the living, breathing demonstration of these stats. And so he kept asking me this question, yeah, but can I really overcome it? Are these, or could these desires actually be who I am? Like, could it be my identity? And so finally, I, I kind of stopped him and I'm like, just let me ask a deeper question. What's driving you to ask these questions? And I looked right into his eyes as I said it. Like, why are you feeling so hopeless? Why are you obsessed with this? And he pointed out something that kind of rocked me, and I want to share something that he shared with me because it, 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 cha- it, it messed with me for weeks, actually. And he said this. He said, he said, well, the reason why I'm struggling with this question so much is because the world says to the gay community that your desires are who you are and that freedom comes by accepting those desires. And so I want to know from you, is the same true for me? Do I just accept the fact that I will always be addicted to alcohol? Do I just accept the fact that I will always be addicted to porn? In other words, my desire for alcohol and for stimulating sexuality is just as deep for me as it is for them. And so do I just accept the fact that a normal life is, is impossible for me, that I should just give in to alcohol, give in to a sexuality that constantly undermines my long-term relationships, and try to gain a peace and a satisfaction with just being different? And then all of a sudden, after he said that, he just burst into tears and he sobbed. And he sobbed in the middle of this. I just embraced him and I held him. And and then he finally just blurted out, and and this was the the next statement that kind of rocked me. And he said, the idea that I am the sum total of my desires, the idea that my identity is actually based on a behavior is the single most enslaving idea I have ever heard in my life. And he burst out into sobbing. And in that moment, you know, I, I, I kind of didn't even know initially how to even respond to him. I just kind of hugged him and, and said, hey, let's walk through this together. And actually, I don't even want to tell you the rest of the story because I, I think it robs the, the, the weight of the questions he was asking. And I, 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 had, had, I was not able to, you know, process it very quickly. Uh, it, but when he said this, I, I suddenly had a revelation as to why there's so much tension in our culture when it comes to topics like divorce or when it comes to topics like gay marriage or when it comes to topics like transgender issues. For example, okay, the LGBTQIA community has long advocated that freedom comes by accepting and celebrating your desires, even the ones that some people would call destructive. And of course, other people that maybe come from like an addiction recovery worldview or maybe who have gone through the process of dealing with, with sex addiction, they would say the exact opposite. They would say freedom comes by overcoming your desires, by systematically rooting them out, by finding what was the nurture issues that suddenly resulted in, in us neurologically um, training ourselves to like certain things. And so um, with this in mind, with this little debate in mind, I want to show you a quick graphic that I think illustrates this this dilemma in a nutshell, I like to call it the freedom paradox because I like to map out these two different worldviews on a, on a spectrum, okay? So we're going to show you a little graphic, and if you can grasp this graphic, these two opposing um, approaches to freedom, I believe it's going to give you a huge, a huge insight on one of the great cultural debates of our time. And again, it's called the freedom paradox. And and again, two completely opposite worldviews that derive hope from two opposite solutions on the, on the, there's the acceptance group and the overcomer group. Now, okay, on this, on this continuum, on the left side of this continuum, you'll notice the acceptance group achieves peace and freedom through acceptance of desire, okay? Now, on the opposite side, you'll notice the overcomer group achieves peace and freedom by the overcoming 
of desire, okay? Each worldview anchors its hope in a completely different way, and each worldview tends to steal hope from the other side of the continuum. And, I, I, and let's just be honest, okay? If I was to come out into this audience and interview every single one of you and, and find out which side do you tend to fall on, all of you would probably flip-flop on this continuum based on the issue. For example, okay, in America, if you ask most people, um, when it comes to alcohol, are, are, should we just accept those as our desires or should we overcome them? Most Americans would say, no, you can overcome that. Uh, and there's some people that don't believe it. No, it's a genetic thing or it's a family issue. With divorce, most Americans tend to side on the acceptance side. You just need to follow your heart. Some people got lucky enough to meet their soulmate. Others of us, it took you know a few tries, right? With pedophilia, we want to believe that people can overcome that, um, but with same-sex attraction, we want to see it more like as, as a genetic thing, right? In other words, every culture tends to arbitrarily decide which types of desires can be overcome and which types of desires can, must be accepted and must be embraced. In fact, you can even hear people's personal opinions on this just by listening to how they talk. You know, like some people, they say, well, I'll always be overweight. I just need to accept it as genetic or I'm Irish, which means I'm always going to be hot tempered in when I drive my car. It's my nature, not my nurture. You know, it's the gene card, right? Kind of like, I'm a man. I'm just not going to ever feel the instinct to unload the dishwasher. Any ladies, ever, you ever heard that? Or, I'm a Packer fan, I'm just going to be a jerk. <laughs> you can't say that this season. It's just not a good season to say that. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I, I, okay, now I joke about that, but I'll be, you know what I'm talking about. There's a, there's a continuum, you know what I'm saying? And, and we all tend to flip-flop based on the issue. Uh, let me give you another example, okay? So right now in the United States, porn addiction is at an all-time high, and there's a huge num amount of research showing that when porn addiction spikes, so does adultery, which is why we're also at a record high. 70% of married couples have had an affair. And now, if you are one of the tens of millions of Americans who are trying to live free of pornography, who are trying to restore your marriage after an affair. You're trying to overcome certain sexual desires. Now, for that group, your hope rests on the idea that, that you can overcome those things. And so when somebody comes along and says, no, that's just who you are, you're naturally gonna be angry. You're naturally gonna fight against anybody who would say otherwise, right? Or, or So when, when the acceptance group comes along and says, no, freedom comes by accepting those desires, you're naturally going to interpret that, that worldview as give up on your marriage, give in to addiction. And in other words, it robs your sense of hope. It robs your sense of stability. And so thus to the overcomer group, the, the acceptor worldview sounds like a devastating and dangerous group. Now let's flip the table for a second, okay? Let me refer to this on the other side. On the flip side, when the overcomer group says to the acceptance group, you don't need legal protections, LGBTQIA, they'll automatically interpret that as you're not worthy of love, you're not worthy of dignity. And, and so conversely, the acceptance group will see the overcomer group as an equally terrifying and closed-minded approach. You see two worldviews in conflict interpreting each other's worldviews in the exact opposite way. And, and really the reason why I'm sharing this is because this freedom paradox, I believe, is at the heart of a huge amount of cultural issues and legislation issues in the U.S. right now. And there's, there happens to be a big, huge stone-throwing contest going on. The acceptance group are labeling the overcomers as homophobes and haters, and the overcomer group are labeling the acceptors as hedonists and homewreckers. And, and let's be honest, can we just call it what it is? Hatred is not indigenous to only one side of this issue. Both sides can be filled with hatred. Both sides, in fact, finger pointing is the very root of self-righteousness. And I think self-righteousness in Pharisaism can be found on both sides of this continuum, okay? And, and, and the unfortunate part of this debate is until we acknowledge this deeper clash of worldviews, not only are we not going to help each other, we're just going to deepen each other's pain. 
And, and maybe it's just me, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe I'm just saying, hey, could we step outside of this and actually have a, a, a much more open-hearted dialogue? I don't believe that the solution is name-calling, and I don't believe that whipping stones on social media is helping anyone. Rather, I believe the solution is actually talking about these issues that create the rift in the first place. And so, really what I'm trying to do today is I'm trying to peel back the layers of the onion that causes all of us to cry, but if we could just peel it back and, and get to a deeper root of issue, I think that we're actually going to have a much more constructive dialogue about it. And I've, over the years, I, whenever I try to talk about these topics, I've, it, it's amazing how many people really, really, really get uncomfortable. And I get it. I get it. Most people don't even want to talk about it because of the sheer enormity of sexual guilt we feel collectively as a culture, okay? We all feel too broken to even have a conversation about it because I think we've all somehow either been victimizers or victims in some sort of strange sort of way. Like for example, earlier I mentioned just 70% of married couples have had an affair. There's, for many people, there's this guilt associated with it that's so heavy, it's just hard to talk about. Or, or, or like this, consider this. 26% of kids in the United States today have witnessed or discovered their father having multiple affairs before age 18. More than one out of four have caught their dad having multiple affairs. 11% of American kids have actually been recruited or involved in keeping a parent's sex addiction a secret. In other words, not only uh, were they, they were actually taught or threatened to not talk about it, and if you think about how, how dysfunctional that is and, and what that, the, 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 the cascading effects, this is something that we are trained to not talk about. It's kind of like I said in, in previous weeks, the porn industry makes more revenue in a year than Microsoft, Google, Amazon, eBay, Yahoo, Apple, and Netflix all put together. And yet nobody talks about it. It's because we just, we, we all like to call, like, and, and obviously the, the lobbyists of that industry want to convince us that there is no effect to that, that there are no actual statistical negative results for that, but, but, but that's simply just not true, and here's why that's bad. The earlier a person is exposed to porn, research shows they are more likely to develop sexual compulsions, more likely to develop addictive behaviors, more likely to develop sexual confusion. And, and here's the kicker for me. There's a huge correlation between people who, the earlier you are exposed to porn, the more likely you are to have a decreased empathy for rape. Okay, there's a huge spike in, so a, a decreased empathy for rape. In other words, you're more likely to believe that when, uh, if a woman cries foul, she's probably just lying or wanting attention. You know what I'm saying? Or if a person says no, they don't really mean that. Uh, decreased empathy, there's this, there, there's this uh, there was all this research done on empathy towards rape, and they found that pe the more people were involved in, in pornographic practices, the less likely they were to feel any for form of empathy for people who had been raped. And, and here's why this is bad. The largest consumer group of internet porn today is boys between the ages of 12 and 17. And then we wonder why there are, is a record number of teenage rapes. 18.3% of American women have now experienced the victimization of rape. And there, there's, here's my point in all of this. There are tens of millions of people who feel so messed up themselves that they don't feel even comfortable talking about it let alone setting some sort of standard for it. And again, if you want this research, I put it all on peterhaas.org. Go ahead, feel free to double check it. I have multiple studies for each idea. But let's return to that slide again, the freedom paradox, okay? The acceptors versus the overcomers, okay? These two different contrasting ideas of freedom, okay? Now, um, let me ask you a trick question in regards to this, okay? And, and when I ask it, don't shut out your opinion because I have warned you it's a trick question, okay? So um, which of these two worldviews does Christianity fit better into? Now, the answer is actually confusing because when you study Scripture long enough, you'll realize the answer is neither and the answer is both. 
Okay, well, how can it be neither and both? That's why it's called the freedom paradox, it, because there's a certain degree of truth to both. Okay, so for, let me give you an example of this. Romans chapter 7 and 8, the Apostle Paul teaches that unless you have a relationship with the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, then you, there are certain desires that you cannot overcome. You cannot change yourself without Christ. If you know right and wrong, but do not have a relationship with the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, change is in fact impossible. And so for a Christian to expect a non-Christian to change certain behaviors, it's ludicrous. It's actually unbiblical to think that a sinner can stop sinning. It's impossible. That was the entire reason why Christ came, because there was zero hope for us. And that's why he had to die on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins and then, and then allow his spirit to come alive on the inside of us, to take us over. And Christ didn't just reform us. He put us to death and rebirthed himself in inside of us. That's why we get baptized. It's a burial service, okay? Burial through baptism, the Bible says, that we had to put ourselves to death. We no longer live. Christ lives within me, okay? So um, again, and even if you do have a relationship with the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, it doesn't mean that you know how to stay in sync with that spirit, Romans 8 teaches. And so in many ways, the Bible actually disagrees with the overcomer worldview because the only people that can actually be overcomers are people who have been baptized in Christ and are continually surrendering to the power of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And there's a whole lot of people that just aren't experiencing that, and therefore overcoming is not realistic, okay? So now, um, uh, let, me, let me, so in some ways the Bible partially disagrees with the overcomer worldview, and don't get me wrong, I'm going to show in just a second that it also agrees with the overcomer worldview, but let me just, just stick with me, okay? On the flip side, the Bible also teaches that there are all sorts of desires that we should resist, that we should not accept, that the acceptor worldview is also not biblical, 1 Corinthians 6, 9. That there's all sorts of desires that you are going to experience that you have to learn how to master. Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, right? It, it, the, the Bible says so many times, don't, don't renew our minds. Let's, let's san be sanctified. Um, and, and no single group has a monopoly on taboo sexual desires. For example, as crude as this might sound, I've yet to meet a man who who's predisposed to monogamy. I'm sure they're out there, but I just haven't met them yet. And, and, and let's be honest, there's desires in all of us that prevent all of us from experiencing life. And thus, the Bible also disagrees with the acceptance group, okay? And yet, okay, now just stick with me. I'm gonna now argue the opposite, okay? The Bible agrees with both worldviews too, okay? So for example, love your neighbor as yourself, Mark 12, 31. Uh, even more, love your enemies, Matthew 5, 44. That seems like a very accepting Bible verse, don't you think? Love your enemies? I mean, that's an acceptance worldview scripture. Um, and yet Jesus also said, contrast to this, Revelation 2, 26, to the one who overcomes, and it's talking about sexual impurity in the context, to the one who overcomes sexual impurity and idolatry and does my will to the end, Jesus says, I will give authority over the nations. To the one who overcomes, sounds like an overcomer verse, doesn't it? Now, hear me out, church. I believe that even as I talk about these types of topics, I know that there's some of you who, as you hear me talk about sexuality and relationships, it unearths a massive amount of pain, it unearths fear, it unearths hurt, and if that's you, I just want you to lean in just for a moment because I believe that God would say to you today that he loves you with an everlasting love. And I, I just want, I believe God brought you to church today so that he could just fill you with his love and his acceptance. Do you realize that, that your eternity is not about your behavior, it is about your belief? Are you hearing me? And if you could just grasp the unconditional love of God today, for some of you, it's going to change everything for you. Because for some of you, you thought Christianity was all about a list of, of do's and don'ts. But as I always say, the Bible is not a list of requirements. It's a list of results after experiencing his love. And God just wants you to experience his love today. I, I recently talked to a young man in our church who was kicked out of his former church 
for simply confessing once that he felt same-sex attraction. He had been kind of struggling with same-sex attraction. And he told me that he, he took the risk, shared it with somebody else in the church, and immediately rumors spread so fast, and he actually was asked to not come back. And he goes, I didn't even act on my feelings. I just shared it with somebody. And he, and he, he just... He said, I, I felt like I lost my entire spiritual family overnight. And as I listened to him, I, I, just, I, I just said to him, I, I can't even imagine how painful that experience must have been. And as he wept on my shoulder, I just, I, I pulled him back and I looked him in the eyes and I said, listen, allow me to be your family. I will be your family. I will walk with you. And you never have to be lonely. You will always have me as your brother and allow me to be your family. And perhaps there's a few of you here today where you can relate to a similar story of rejection and hurt. Now on the opposite side of the spectrum, I also know many people in our church who have had a spouse or a parent abandoned them or abandoned their family for a gay relationship. I know many spouses who've been stuck in a poverty scenario due to, to their spouse's sexual decisions. And, and th those people, for those people, their pain and rejection is equally strong and angry. Now, the reason why I bring this up is because no matter where you sit on the spectrum, there's a pain that rises in this discussion. In fact, belief can oftentimes arrive out of pain. But listen, that pain will never be quenched by immersing yourself in politics or by surrounding yourself with all acceptors or with all overcomers. And that's the tendency. When we are wounded, we like to surround ourselves with all people who agree with us. And the, the problem with that is all of a sudden we're not, we're not going to, that, that actually decreases compassion. And that's actually one of the problems in our society is that we don't know how to interact with people anymore that we disagree with. We don't even know how to have, we don't know how to listen to people anymore. And, and, and we live in a culture that is so acclimated to finger pointing, which is self-righteousness, which is really self-righteous fundamentalism in its most basic sense. Whether you even believe in God, you can be a self-righteous Pharisee. And, and, and listen, uh, the only way our lives will ever find freedom is if we embrace a third way. And that way is not your way, it is not my way, but it is a higher way. And I like to call it the way of Christ. And so in our final minutes, I would love to unpack this third option by sharing, just by ending with a simple story out of John chapter 8. And we're going to start in verse 5. And of course, if you don't have your Bibles, we'll have this up on the screen. But I really believe that present within this passage is a third option that I believe is the only option that will bring about healing and will bring about freedom, not just in our own personal lives, but freedom in our culture. And of course, just to set up the context, the Pharisees had brought before Christ a woman who was caught in adultery. And so they bring her before Jesus and in John chapter 8, verse 5, they say, In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. You kind of wonder what in the world he was doing here. Is he just kind of like spaced out and just like... I'm just going to let this, this argument kind of play itself out, right? While they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, if any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. And at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Verse 10, Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Now, I want you to watch what Jesus does here because it's actually quite brilliant. Again, the Pharisees were trying to catch Jesus watering down the truth. And rather than lowering the bar, Jesus turned it on them and said, you know what? You're right. According to Moses, she is guilty. 
And so now he who is without sin cast the first stone. In other words, he was pointing out to them that the very fact that you feel qualified to be the accuser shows that you are in sin. Finger pointing by its very nature is self-righteous. And so Jesus was saying, you're actually guilty too. He who is without sin cast the first stone. And of course, they didn't even know what to do. I love that. It says the older people left sooner because, you know, let's be honest, older people are wiser and younger people are idealistic. And it's just, let's just call it out. And I, I think it's fun that the Bible even says it. But, uh, you know, again, so, you know, Jesus, they were trying to catch Jesus, and, but he makes the two profound statements, okay? He says, you're right, she's guilty, he's without sin, um, cast the first stone. But then he makes, and I want to point this out, he makes two extremely profound statements after this, okay? And it is absolutely critical you listen to these two statements. He says, neither do I condemn you. That's the first statement. And then his other statement is this, go and sin no more. Neither do I condemn you go and sin no more. Neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. Now here's the deal. Most Christians want to eliminate one of these two statements out of their Bibles. And I know that some of you would be like, well, I would never do that. But uh, you know, again, I'm just saying most Christians, all of us have this temptation to want to emphasize one of those statements to the exclusion of the other, okay? And, and let me just unpack that. Some Christians want to eliminate this idea of go and sin no more, because come on, I don't even think pastors should even be talking about sin. That just sounds so judgmental. In fact, there's entire denominations that are predicated upon the idea of let's just eliminate any Bible verse that calls anything out about sin. In fact, you just avoid those churches that talk about money, even though we have a massive problem with, with debt and with with impulsiveness and with greed in our country. Let's not talk about it. Let's not talk about sexuality. That makes people uncomfortable. Let's not talk about alcohol because right here, especially here in Minnesota where we spend over $1 billion a year on drunk driving related stuff. Let's not even talk about that when it comes to our state budget. Let's just kind of live in denial of the fact that we have these issues and because it makes people uncomfortable and, and Jesus was all about love and let's just kind of make people feel comfortable, right? And, but here's the problem to this kind of approach to Christianity, aside from the fact that we're ripping half of the pages of the Bible out of the Bible, here's the problem. Throwing out the compass has never been a good way to get out of the wilderness. And when people are about to touch the hot stove, if you love them, you're going to say, mm, that might be hot, okay? You're at least going to say it. And, and then if they want to continue to do it and be like, my choice, boom, you know, like let them, you know what I'm saying? Like at least, you know, like our, my, my job is not to control you. My job is just to say, hey, oh, that must have hurt. Can I get you a piece of ice to put that on there? No. If they want to choose that response. You see, again, want to eliminate the, the idea of sin. But listen, I, recently BBC News out of England, uh, they did a story on America's out of control pedophilia problem. And they were reporting, they were doing all these interview, interviews with high up FBI people on how every major city in the United States has an unprecedented uh, pedophilia prostitution ring, that there are more um, kids that are being trafficked, uh, you know, as young as nine, 10 years old for these pedophilia prostitution rings, and that very few, even U.S. states, especially Minnesota, have laws to even put any of these people in prison, that the average um, pedophile, even after being caught multiple times, will not even get a prison sentence. And the FBI is so overwhelmed that they only have the resources to rescue maybe at most 600 kids a year nationally, and yet right here within the Twin Cities, there are close to 2,000 known pedophiles that the government knows are actively trafficking um, porn, child porn, and yet they don't have the resources to prosecute them. And I remember thinking, you got to be kidding me. You got to, like right here, you see, someone's got to talk about this stuff. Why, like, why, do, why are we so afraid to talk about this? This is wrecking lives. It's because it makes some people uncomfortable. That's why. And, and, but, but here's the deal. We can't just arbitrarily say, well, you can give in to that desire. You cannot. You can. You cannot. You can. You cannot. And, and I'm, why do I make that decision? Just because based on how culturally people feel right now. You know what I'm saying? 
On the opposite extreme, there are Christians that want to eliminate the other statement of Christ, the neither do I condemn you statement of Christ, right? There are some people will, where, who all they ever do is beat people up with the commands of Scripture. There's no grace. There's no acceptance, no listening. It's just judgment and truth, as though somehow those things are going to bring about change in people. But listen, the Bible teaches that only kindness can unlock repentance, Romans 2.4. And if we aren't giving people an encounter with the kindness of God, they're never going to change. You can actually force people into false repentance, but it's not going to last because truth doesn't lead to repentance. Kindness leads to repentance, the Bible says. Truth will keep you in repentance, the Bible teaches, but we have to get the order right. And here's the point. The power of the gospel rests in both of these statements together, that neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. Jesus advocating for both accepting and overcoming. Or if I could put it this way, Christ would say, I accept you as you are, but I love you too much to leave you the same. I accept you as you are, but I love you too much to leave you the same. Here's my point. We as a church have to learn how to live in the tension of both grace and truth. We cannot We cannot afford to be Christians who throw away the compass or there will be hundreds of millions of more people who will experience the pain of adultery, rape, depression, confusion. Besides, 18 of the 27 books of the New Testament have a lot to say about sexuality. However, we, in light of that though, we, can, we also cannot afford to throw away grace and acceptance just because it makes certain modern Pharisees feel uncomfortable. Listen to me. We can accept people without having to agree with them. You realize that, right? We can accept people without having to agree with them. We don't have to see eye to eye in order to walk hand in hand. We don't have to think alike. We just have to think together. Listen, we can even give people dignity, even legal protections without having to agree with them. I know that sounds so novel and so hard for some people, but it's true. You can give people dignity and legal protection without agreeing. That's one of the things that actually I think makes America amazing. Because here's the big picture, and if we see this from God's perspective, just see this from God's perspective, okay? Step outside of all the little political debates, all the ethical dilemmas, all, the, all that stuff, okay? And, and you're God, and, and you've made a way where there is no way. And this is, the, this is what God would say. John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Let me read this as though God would say it in the first person. I so loved you that I gave my one and only son for you, to die for you, to forgive you, so that it's not even based on you or your behavior. And whosoever would believe in him, you won't have to experience eternal death. It's beautiful. Whosoever believes, whosoever believes, who falls under the context of whosoever? Anyone. Anyone who believes, no matter where you stand on the political spectrum, if we could just pause our discussion and absorb that truth, all of a sudden it puts things into perspective, doesn't it? There is a life that is bigger and more important than the one we're currently living, and it's called eternal life. And there is a reality worth apprehending that is far, that is far greater than the desires we're currently feeling. And if you could just pause for a second and allow that reality to invade your soul. Some of you, I'm telling you, it's going to be freedom for the very first time because it's not going to be you being, um, it's not going to be you being lassoed into a moral construct, a set of do's and don'ts. It's going to actually be you being drafted into this great, beautiful, mysterious, mystical, powerful relationship with an almighty God. And and if you don't have that, let me tell you, that's what I want for you. And I don't know what you're struggling with, but I do believe that God can overcome that thing. And I don't know what you're struggling with, but I do believe that God has open arms for you as well. Would you just embrace the love that he has, embrace the security that he brings, and in the midst of all that weird tension, just allow God to do what he does. Would you allow me to do that with you? today in a moment of prayer. Bow your heads. Let's close our eyes 
and let's surrender. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are giving us a higher way, a path that is a narrow path that is unlike the path of so many people in this world, but I pray that you would enable us to transcend those types of, all that kind of baggage that comes along with this world and experience the true joy, and that's you dying for us and redeeming us for the life that you created. Help us to live that. In Jesus' name we pray. And if you agree with that prayer, say amen. Amen. With all that said, I'm going to have our campus pastors come on up and tell us where we're going to go next. I love you guys. We'll see you next week.